I'm Ashley Brown, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mock. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Ashley Brown. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories today. Author interviews, writing advice, the very best people in writing today. Join me each and every weekday. You can find all of the archives at hankgarner.com. Before we get started, let's talk about some sponsors today. Writing novels is hard, but Dabble makes it easier. Dabble replaces your word processor doing what it can't. Dabble organizes your manuscript, story notes, and plot. It simplifies story, leaving more room in your brain to create. And after all, that is what being a writer is all about. Dabble was built from the ground up specifically for writing novels. It takes minutes to learn, and it makes writing a joy. See how Dabble will revolutionize the way you write with a free trial at www.dabblewriter.com. Today's episode is sponsored by editor Ellen Campbell. Authors, if you are looking for someone to help shape your words into what you originally intended them to be, Ellen uh, can help you do that. Ellen is one of the most sought-after indie editors out today, and she is one of the best. I've used her. So many other people in the community have used her. There's a link to her website in the show notes. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytelling. Today, I'm really excited to have Ashley Brown on the show with me. Ashley has a fantastic new book called Letters to the Daughter I'll Never Have. Uh, and guys, let me tell you what, this book uh, hit me on a really deep emotional level uh, in, in a lot of different ways. And I'm excited to talk to Ashley about it today. Uh, Ashley, welcome to the Thank show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be talking with you. Well, thanks for joining me. Um, you know that we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Yeah, it's interesting for me. That's kind of a two-phase answer for me. Um, and the first goes back to when I was very little. And it's more of a sensory memory. My parents had an actual typewriter. And I would just, I loved the feel and the sound and the experience of using the typewriter. So to do that, I had to think of things to write. Um, and so so that's <laughs> I, I really, I, again, I would just hole up in the study and put the paper in and start, you know, look around the room and make up a story about uh, my stuffed animal that was sitting there or something like that. Um, and so I just enjoyed that, that uh, process kind of all by myself. So I didn't think of myself as a storyteller. I, didn't, I never dreamt, oh, I'm going to be a writer someday. It was just a fun thing that I liked to do. Um, similarly, I remember putting together a little book for a, like a third grade class project. And again, just the sensory experience of like, like I literally made the book, you know, I stapled the, the handwritten pages together and drew illustrations and, and I, it was called the bad luck kid. <laughs> so obviously I, it stuck in my memory. <laughs> um, and, and so I just, I, I loved it, but somewhere along the way, I, I think I lost my confidence i lost probably a little bit of an imagine you know confidence in my imagination and i stopped enjoying writing for a really long time um i, I still i loved english I, I loved talking about books um all throughout school but writing became more of a really scary vulnerable process where i felt like nothing i put down on paper ever quite matched up to my expectations in my brain <laughs> um and, right. and so it was always a, more of a stressful process to write something and, and have to, you know, turn it into a teacher that I knew was going to read it. And and it felt like giving a part of me to, you know, it was just it became I, I lost the joy in it. Um, yeah. And so really, it was much more recent, probably three years ago that um, that I revisited that part of myself. And it was a few different um, things that that led to it. Um 
my husband is a writer. Uh, he's published 18 or 19 books, mostly poetry. And, and we had a long distance relationship for the first two years of our relationship long ago. And, and so that meant a lot of emails. <laughs> and, um, and even now he travels a lot. So a lot of our communication has always been emailing and he would always tell me, Ashley, you're a writer. Your emails are just beautiful works of literature <laughs> and art. <laughs> um, and I would just, you know, wave my hand off like, yeah, whatever, you know, you're, oh, yeah, you're, the, you're the writer in the family, whatever. Um, and so I had that little voice in my head um, telling me that for years. And then um, I went back to school and uh, for a graduate degree. And that was primarily that was just a whole lot of writing. And that's where I rediscovered the joy in it. For so I think I'm just at a place in my life. I, I, I rediscovered my confidence. It felt fun to make myself vulnerable and to challenge myself. It didn't feel scary anymore. And so that sort of reawakened this love for writing in me. Um, and then sort of the last part of that is I had a friend who who texted me one day that a local magazine was looking for writers. And I wrote him back and said, why did you send me this? Like, is this a mistake? And um, he said, well, no, I mean, you help me edit my writing all the time. I figure, you know, you, you would be pretty good at this. And and. So I so I I interviewed with them and I've been writing with them for years and so that that moment when I you know was hired by them and I I had I could go around telling people I'm a writer you know I'm a freelance writer <laughs> it was that was a kind of the big moment for me um, when I again sort of had the the confidence to to say yes I'm a writer and uh, and I love it. <laughs> that um, my friend Dave Rudden uh, who writes middle grade books and young teen books uh, does a lot of uh, school um, you know workshops with kids and, and things like that and um, he said that if you ask uh, you know a, like a seven to nine year old kid or if you tell them you know you can be a writer they'll say of course I can I've written 15 books uh -huh. already <laughs> and uh, you know but if you ask a 13 14 year old or if you tell them they could be a writer they're just going to stare at their shoes and you know they're like ah. you know and and I think a lot of us go through that there's this initial phase of the uh, of just kind of knowing uh, that that we are this thing and uh and just having the freedom of that uh and then a lot of times we lose the joy in it and and for a lot of us it takes a lot of years to get back to that so uh, i think your story is actually pretty common yeah yeah and you know i don't know if it's if it's sad or just a reality of of what happens to us in those <laughs> those teenage years or through schooling or whatever but it does seem all too common that like like the word freedom that you said you know we lose there's some kind of freedom we lose somewhere along the way to be, I don't know, to be ourselves, to be confident, to I, to follow our joy. I don't know what it is, but it, it sure does seem common. Yeah. So, uh, so you started writing uh, for, uh, for uh, local magazines and stuff. What kinds of things were you writing? Um, a lot of personal sort of get to know get to know people in the area stories. Um, I live in the Texas Hill Country in a town called Wimberley. Um, and so it's just a very tight knit community, all the little towns around Austin, um, kind of, there's a bond of any of, of all of us, I feel like. And so, so a lot of the stories are um, getting to know really interesting people and what they've done in the area and the businesses that they built and, and uh, stories on other, you know, writers, photographers, um, just sort of a lot of again, in personal stories. <laughs> um, gotcha. Um, you uh, you mentioned that uh, that your husband is a writer and that you guys would have these uh, these long um, email exchanges, and uh, I, I still love email for for that same fact, even though uh, a lot of our communication has been supplanted by social media and, and the, uh, the idea of kind of instant chat and, and those sorts of things. I, I still love the idea of, uh, of being able to get your thoughts out before hitting send and reading over and editing yourself and really saying what you meant to say instead of just the first thing that was top of mind. Yeah. Um, it's the, yeah, I, I feel like we're we're kind of losing that as yeah, an art. Yeah, it's. Um, I think that's why he and and other people would make comments because I did. I took time with my emails, and I guess that is a bit of a lost art. Which and it's funny because <laughs> we're talking about emails and not even letters. You know, <laughs> back 
<laughs> exactly. Um, like we don't even have the time to write an email, you know, type up an email. But, um, right. And and to be honest, you know, I love actual. I mean, you know, ironically, given the name of my book, but I have always loved letter writing. Um, and again, taking that time. And I, honestly, I did a lot of that for myself in those years. I'm probably digressing, but in those years when I sort of when I say I lost the joy in writing or the confidence and didn't like doing it for other people, um, I continued to always keep massive journals and diaries for myself. And, and, and a lot of that included, you know, kind of letters, letters to God, letters to people that I had a crush on that I was never going to share with, you know, (laughs) I was never going to share it, but, but it felt so good to just take the time to get my thoughts down on paper, um, especially directed to somebody else. And so, so yeah, eventually that became emails and, and yeah, I think it's, it's, for me, it's a, it's just a really fun, I can get lost in writing an email to a friend and spend an hour on it. And that's, that's fun. And is a lot more meaningful than, you know, than some text exchanges. Um, I feel like, yeah, it's, it's taking the time to say, you know, I, I care about you enough and think about you enough and I want to share my thoughts with you. And so I'm going to, you know, actually expound and, and use proper grammar to an extent. <laughs> and <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's, it's fun. And, 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 well, I was, I was hoping you would, you would come around to, uh, to talking about journaling. I, I had a feeling that you were a, a journaler and someone who wrote, um, letters, uh, even ones that, that never got sent or, you know, for, for people as a, as a cathartic thing for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, because in your book, Letters to the Daughter I'll Never Have, uh, this is, this is a, uh, a really fascinating journey. Um, and I, I felt like this was not just something you sat down to do as a particular project, but this was an extension of kind of your creative process that was already in place or, uh, maybe your, uh, you know, your way that, that you deal with things. Um, tell us a little bit about, um, where this book came from and the, the, the really, interesting subject matter that kind of jumps at us as, as soon as we see the cover. What, where did this book come from? Why did you write these? And, and give us a little bit of the background on, on, on your feelings about the situation just in general. Um, yeah, I mean, you're exactly right in that this came out of my need to express my feelings, not to write a book, um, not, you know, not, I really had to yeah. do this um, to get to get my personal feelings down on paper. And it's, and it came to me um, through sort of a series of conversations with my husband and even my therapist actually um, in, in these years, as I was trying to decide um, whether or not to have children. And I'm a really indecisive person in general um, about everything. (laughs) um, The smallest things to the biggest things, it's all the same process for me. And, um, and my husband can be similar, and he he has a grown daughter. Um, she's 22 now, so he has been a parent, and so we were we were both very much on the same page and sort of sharing all the same you know pros and cons and um, reasons that we really wanted to have a child together and reasons that we really didn't. Uh, but it's still in the end. I mean, basically, he he would he would be open to it if I said I wanted to do it, and and it, we. So I, I say my decision because you know, we're kind of coming at it from two different places. He has, again, he has been a parent and I have not. Um, so it's a bit of an individual journey, even though we're making the decision together. Um, so I felt like it was kind of on my shoulders and I had so many contradictory feelings about it. Um, and and I, I, also, I also have found recent, in recent years of my life that ceremony and rituals are are things that are important to me um, in terms of recognizing, you know, the joys in life and the losses in life um, and any, any sort of meaningful, uh, you know, change in life. I feel like it, it, it is better accepted. I have more peace with it, whether it's a good or bad thing. If I sort if I do some kind of something to honor what, whatever it is. Um, and so with that sort of personality trait, um, I realized that I had to do something, some kind of ceremony in order to, 
to have peace with what seemed to be a decision I was making. You know, time kept going by and I wasn't ready to be a parent. So it seemed like I was probably saying I'm not going to. Um, and it just struck me the only way I'm going to feel OK about that is to talk directly to my imaginary daughter. She's the one I want to I want to experience being her mom um, in this ceremony and in this fantasy way so that I can really recognize all my feelings surrounding it and really be honest about them and see how I feel at the end of it. Um, so that's where that's where that came from. <laughs> the The title of the book is Letters to the Daughter I'll Never Have. Uh, this is uh, uh, I, I've seen some other books similar to this and, and, and I'm using similar in a, in a very loose way. Um, this is a really unique book, but um, uh, you know, we, we've heard stories from people that were not able to have children for one reason or another, and then, you know, kind of living out the fantasy of what that might be. And maybe fantasy is not the correct word. I apologize. Uh, but th just the, the working through the emotions of that. Um, your story is different because you consciously chose, um, not to have a child. And, and, and you even talk about the, um, you know, the, the difficulty in even choosing, uh, you know, in the beginning of the book. Um, what to talk a little bit about this decision and what was it about having children um, that you that, that caused you to choose to not take that path? Um, a lot of it is. I mean, there's so many factors. Um, a lot of it is is just sort of life circumstance of of how where I've ended up and, and how and why and with whom um, and feeling like it's okay that my, I feel like my circumstances aren't ideal for being a parent. In other words, like my husband and I don't make a lot of money to be blunt. Um, and I talk about that pretty openly in the book. Um, and, and I say, we like not having to, you know, we live this kind of beautiful, simple life. Um, and you know, it's stressful enough when one of us has like a, a little health issue. Um, and you know, we have an unexpected cost of a few hundred dollars, um, or even again, a vet bill, you know, for a, for my dog that gets sick, um, that's tough for us financially. And so that's been a huge factor as we've talked about it over the years of just, you know, would it be responsible to bring a child into our family when, when we're not really set up to deal with, um, circumstances that may arise. I, we certainly don't believe, again, kids need a whole lot of money and stuff um, to be happy and healthy. But, but you know, we're just, we're just very, I guess, uh, realistic or maybe scared people. Um, you could look at it either way. You know, we're realistic and acknowledging all the stuff that could go not as planned. Um, some people might say, well, again, that's ridiculous. Nothing ever goes as planned. You guys, you're just, you know, you're living in fear, however you want to paint it. Um, but that that's been a big again, just sort of, it's the reality of, of our lives. Um, and we don't want to get jobs we hate and to just to make money to, so that we can, you know, be provide better for a child. Um, uh, similarly, you know, just again, all the stresses that it would add uh, to our relationship. Um, I, you know, I don't know if that I have some of the innate, uh, skills or traits required in a parent. Again, I think I'd be great, but I think I, as a mom, because I am, I am a loving, caring, nurturing person. Um, but I would want, I, I give things so much advanced thought that, right. <laughs> that it's not okay for me to just think like, Oh, I'll just figure it out. Like, Hey, I, right now I, you know, I need 10 hours <laughs> of sleep in my life and a, a kid's not going to allow for that, but I'll just figure it out. Like, that's not, that's not my personality. <laughs> um, you know, I feel like if, <laughs> what if I don't figure it out? What if I'm stressed out and miserable for five years because I'm not getting enough sleep and my child senses that and then I don't have a happy child, you know, so I'm, a, I'm an overthinker. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so all, you know, it's a lot of that. And then um, my husband and I also feel very strongly that to, that there are, there are plenty of, of people in the world um, and that our world is being put under a lot of stress um, right now, our environment, our planet. Um, and that honestly, you know, we're a little scared about the, again, you know, scared slash realistic about the future of, of our planet, of our environment. Um, and again, wonder if we would feel okay, but we don't, 
we don't judge anyone else for any, you know, I don't, I don't look at someone with six children and have any thoughts or feelings about them. This is just our very personal decision that maybe we have love and care to give to the life that's already here, um, rather than adding to the population and an environment that we feel is in a pretty dangerous place right now. It's a lot. <laughs> Do you, f well, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I understand those things. Uh, do you feel, you know, for, for so long, um, we, we have these ingrained, uh, societal expectations that, uh, when, when we, when, when men and women reach a certain age that we will, um, settle down, get married, have kids. And, and it's just kind of, uh, it's the, the expected thing more so than not. Um, when you consciously choose to, to step outside that paradigm and to to go a different path, do you do you feel judgment from other people, uh, or and if you do, does does writing a book like this help to uh, to help other people to understand? Um, I am really lucky that I personally have not felt judged. I have heard stories, um, but for, but in our in our sort of circle of people in our world, um, many of our our friends and, and colleagues and acquaintances um, have made similar decisions or they live, or in one way or another, they kind of live outside the, the, the norm, <laughs> um, you know, maybe for just in all sorts of different, there are all, all kinds of examples, but, you know, just not that traditional of getting married young and, and having the children and the typical job and that kind of thing. You know, we know a lot of artists and musicians and, <laughs> and so, so again, we're lucky. And, and again, a lot of people, um, a lot of my closest friends have, have made the decision as well not to have children. So I, I, I have not felt judged by anyone that I know. Um, sure. I've gotten a little bit, you know, I'll, I'll have, I, I, I get this, the sort of head cock from moms who like, Oh, kind of like, I feel sorry for you. Cause you'll never, you know, you'll never understand the the joy of being like your like your existence will not be um, quite what it could be or should be because you're missing out on this mothering thing. Um, so I felt a little bit of that, whether I invented it or not. I've I've felt that coming from moms. Um, and and in writing the book to answer the second part of your question, I. I, I feel like I wrote it and, and decided to make it public, you know, to publish it um, a lot less to deal with me feeling judged and a lot more um, to maybe help other women who have been where, you know, I said I'm lucky and I haven't been. Um, but I have again heard a lot of stories of women in their their 20s. And I think it might even be harder. I'm 39. And so it's not again, my life circumstances are a little bit different. It's not as, quote, weird, maybe that I'm making the decision because I, 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 you know, I'm, it's a little late in life for me. Um, so there are further risks and my husband is older as well. I think it's a lot harder maybe for a woman who's in her twenties and happily married and is, is struggling with the decision to maybe not be a parent. And I I've heard that, you know, again, from friends of friends that there are a lot of younger women out there who are having a hard time, you know, what's wrong with me that I maybe don't want to do that. And, and is that okay? Um, and so I felt like maybe this could be a little bit of a bridge and a, you know, comfort to others. Um, and again, just a conversation starter, you know, a way to, to inspire finding what we all have in common and how, you know, ways we can love the family that we create, whatever that family is and understand one another, um, rather than worrying about the family that somebody else has chosen to have and what that looks like and why, <laughs> and maybe not judging. <laughs> it, right. Right. Um, in the book, you deal with, uh, you write letters to your, uh, to your daughter from, uh, from when, when she's, uh, a, a newborn baby all the way through, um, some different stages of maturity, uh, and different, uh, life experiences, uh, that she would have, uh, some of them, uh, kind of mm -hmm. funny and, uh, you know, the, the way that we, uh, look at, uh, you know, just the, the, the crazy things that happen along the way and, and, uh, the humor that we can find in that, uh, but some are very, very serious and very, um, almost painful to read, uh, just like life is sometimes painful mm -hmm. to watch. Um, 
how do you, uh, when you're putting together a collection like this, how do you choose the, the life events? How do you choose the, uh, the topics that are important to you that you really want to work through? Um, uh, yeah, how how does putting a, a collection like this together? Yeah, work? Um, that's a great question, and I don't know if I have a great answer. It, a lot of it just it just came to me. I had no master plan um, whatsoever. Um, I had in mind that that I wanted to because I kind of wanted to experience this uh, to experience the feelings of motherhood authentically, um, and that was part. You know, every time I sat down to write a letter, I really wanted to live as as a mom of, of my little girl who then did grow up. And so, so in my mind, it made sense to move through her life chronologically. So that, that was, you know, that was the, always in my head. Um, I didn't necessarily write them. I'm trying to think. And I guess I did, I guess I kind of did write them in that order. So if there's anything age, you know, related, I, I wrote the ones about, you know, her first birthday, um, her 16th birthday, you know, I, I, I wrote those, in order. Um, and the others really, I would just be driving along and, and I would think, Oh, I want to write to her about that. Um, you know, whether it's again, food, food memories from my childhood and then, you know, thinking, cause that, that food is a big deal. And what would I, what would I feed my daughter and how would we work out me being a vegetarian? And, um, so they, it just, it all came to me very organically. Um, and if I had an idea, I would just jot it down or put a reminder on my phone. And next time I sat down to write, you know, that's that's the letter I wrote while it was while I was excited about it. Um, and then some of them, um, you know, so, some like even the first one where I, I I opened the book by trying to explain to her why I'm not having her. That felt necessary, but it was really more challenging um, to try to put all that into into words, although of course that's essentially what the entire book is an effort to do, um, is you know, to come to terms with why I'm not having her, but to try to tell her sort of as this baby self, um, why I wasn't that there were some ideas that were like, okay, I'm going to have to tackle that one. That just seems like it, it needs to be discussed, but it was a little more challenging to do so. So, um, again, for the most part, they're all just things that over the span of six months or seven months or eight months, just it's like, I want to talk to her about that. I've got to talk to her about that. <laughs> at the, at the end, uh, when you had finished the, the series of letters and, and you felt good about the, um, uh, the, the, the coverage that you had given it and the, the topics that you wanted to talk about, um, how did you feel uh, at the end of it. Uh, and we'll talk in a minute about, about what you hope that other people get from the book, but, but how did this affect you? And did you get the, the feelings of, of closure? Maybe closure is not the right word, but the, uh, the feelings that you had dealt with these, uh, these kind of, uh, stranded feelings about the situation when you finish this? I did, you know, that's, I, that's a beautiful term, these stranded um, feelings. It's, uh, <laughs> It, it absolutely gave me a, a place to land those feelings and for them to exist sort of forever and for it to all be okay. All the, all the reasons that I'm relieved and happy, I'm not going to be dealing with being a mom um, and all the ways that I, that I'm going to be happy with the family I do have. And that includes again, animal, animal children, <laughs> you know, my pets. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then, and some of the terrible, terrible sadness of the things I'm not going to get to experience because of what I'm choosing. Um, just knowing that they exist there, you know, on the pages, just like we talked about earlier with, you know, journaling and writing letters, you're never going to send to anybody. There's just something for me that has always been, comforting about the knowledge that it exists somewhere, you know, those feelings, the thoughts are, are safe um, in, in that place. And so the process was extremely helpful to me. I loved, loved every minute of it. And that's again, part of what, why, why I still feel comfortable saying I'm a writer, which sometimes I'm still, I'm a little too, I don't know if meek is the word, but I, I still have trouble with that. And like, yeah, okay. I've published a book. I'm a writer. Um, <laughs> uh, but 
but for me, again, that's something kind of big and grand. Um, but the, the reason that I feel comfortable saying that is because of the joy that I felt every time I sat down to do the, the work of the writing. Um, it was right. even well, the set. And, and yeah, if you're, sorry, go ahead. If, if, no, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, if you're producing meaningful stuff, um, I think that's kind of a natural reaction that, um, that sometimes the, the work is bigger than us and it's, and it's, and it, uh, you know, comes from places that we can't always put our finger on. And, uh, that kind of sense of, of humility in, you know, that, uh, in offering this thing to the world, um, uh, I think that's a good thing yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think so many people do feel that. Um, I don't think I'm alone <laughs> in right. those feelings. Um, and so, yeah, I was, um, I think because of how helpful it was for me and because of the meaning that it gave to me, it did kind of speak to it, 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 it decided that it needed to be a book. You know, I did, I wrote it and again, very much for personal reasons. And I put it aside when I was done. Um, I fully left it alone. I was like, okay, done. You know, I feel pretty good about this decision now. It was a very helpful process. Um, and and, and left it for a, a while um, and and came back to it for reasons that may or may not be important. Um, and then, you know, and, and got an editor and decided I was actually going to turn it into something that, that could be read by other people. Um, and, and that just kind of, it might sound a little hippy dippy, but that just the universe kind of suggested to me, it just sort of plopped in my lap. Yeah, this needs to be, you know, it needs revisit that, publish it. Um, cause maybe it will, you know, if, if one person reads it and it means something to them or helps in any way, um, then, you know, what a, what a wonderful thing to have, to have done. So, right. Yeah. Right. When you're sharing something like this with other people and, and these are extremely personal, I mean, there, there's nothing more personal than, uh, than you, uh, expressing, um, to, to this person who will never be, um, and, and working that out. Um, th there's nothing more personal than that. Um, when you decide to put this out there to the world, um, what are your hopes that people will take away from this? I mostly hope that, that if any, that it inspires comfort and conversation and, and connection. Um, and, that even if yeah, it's, it, it's so personal. So there are going to be so many things that, that are just true to me in my life. Um, but I would hope that underneath that, um, there are people who can find a common, you know, they can relate to a feeling, even if they can't relate to that very, you know, personal story that I told that had to do with that feeling. Um, and that, that again, can just provide comfort because it is, you know, there, there is a lot of love in these letters and there's a lot of pain. Um, there's a lot of complicated stuff about family. Um, and, and again, the choices that we make. And so, um, you know, and I would be humbled and honored if it offered anyone comfort in their own tricky life decisions, whatever those decisions are, um, whether they're a parent or not, you know, whether they're a man or a woman, um, that there's just some kind of, okay, maybe it's, you know, maybe there's this person out there can, can relate and maybe somehow that makes it okay. Maybe I'm not so much alone. Um, that would be, again, a, the best I could ask for. <laughs> right. Well, the book is fascinating. It's called Letters to the Daughter I'll Never Have. Uh, it's on sale everywhere now. Um, Ashley, if people are just learning about you and your work, is there a place online where they could connect with you and, and uh, find out about more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my website is ashleyauthor.com. So A-S-H-L-E-Y-A-U-T-H-O-R.com. And there's a, you know, a, a contact form there. I would love to you know hear from people. Um, and, uh, and, and then my book is available on that site as well. So ashleyauthor.com. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm on all the well, not all, but I'm, still, I'm, an, I'm kind of an old lady when it comes to the social media, um, but you know, the Instagram and, <laughs> and, and Facebook and all that, my friends, Joe, I, I always put the in front of all those things. I'm on the Facebooks. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I yeah, love it. I don't it. know why I'm just, uh, again, an old lady when it comes to that stuff, but, but yeah, that's my website. <laughs> 
Awesome. Well, Ashley, um, we're going to link everything in the show notes uh, and help people find you. Uh, the book, again, Letters to the Daughter I'll Never Have, is on sale now. There's a link to it in the show notes. Uh, Ashley, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show oh, today. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. You can find archives of all of the shows at hankgarner.com. And when you're there, please subscribe. Up next is an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. He was just seven when his parents died. Eliza received the news of their death on Halloween morning, but she kept it from Jason for two more days. She sent him out trick-or-treating. He was a vampire. He spun around in the living room, eyes wild, shouting, I am the living dead! and wondering why they didn't laugh. On November 2nd, after school, Eliza told him. His parents were dead. It was a bleak time. He wanted silence. He wanted darkness. He cried great, rolling tears. In early spring, he ran away from home, which means he stole five dollars, put a box of Cheez-Its in a pillowcase, and walked seven blocks. He slept in a field, glad to be miserable. He wanted to freeze to death, to be with his mom and dad, to not feel anything. His grandmother found him at a playground near the river, fallen in the dust with his shoulder against the slope of a teeter-totter, the other end riderless, suspended. He saw her trudging up the hill. She looked twice her usual size in her winter coat and frightening. Let's go home, Jason. He knew he was in trouble. He knew what home meant. It meant a paddling or worse. Eliza opened her big winter coat and, straining, slipped down into the dust next to him. She drew him into her warm body, wrapping him in the coat. She flipped the collar up, rubbed her hands together, and cupped them over his ears. Burr, you're an ice cube, but it feels good, kinda. It's good to get really cold sometimes, wakes you up. They were cheek to cheek against the teeter-totter, bundled together as the sky turned from gray to orange. The ground stung, but they sat a long time. Why? The word was just a tiny puff of vapor that slipped from his lips and into the wind, but it was also big, big and heavy. She knew what his little boy heart had asked. She understood the universe of longing and confusion and hurt in that one whispered word. We all die, baby. In all the long, long history of the world, there's not been one of us who didn't. I'll die, he said. It wasn't a question, but it was. Yes, and I'll die a lot sooner, and the why is just... It's just there. It just is. We're not around to see what was before us, and we're not here to see what happens after. The trees on the edge of the playground shivered with dawn. But we're here now, she said, and pulled him tighter until his cheekbone felt sore from pressing against hers. And it has to be enough. It has to be. Look at all we have now. Really look. He really looked. It was just a small playground off the main road of an unimportant New England town. But in the distance he could see the wide Kennebec River, and the sky was pink above it. He saw small ships moored, trimmed in red and baby blue, rocking against the current. He saw a robin on the railing of a dock, toes pointed inward, making occasional hops that were also flight. The town was waking up. There was a light in the bakery and one in the grocery. There was an empty can of beer on a picnic table and wildflowers by the road. There was wind and trees swaying gently. There was his own breath in his own lungs. There was his grandmother, her body, her heartbeat against his back as he leaned against her chest. There was his own life and hers and a world to live them in. And it was enough. 